Intellectual freedom begins when one says with Socrates that he knows that he knows nothing, and then goes on to add, do you know what you don't know, and therefore what you should know? If your answer is affirmative and humble, then you are your own teacher. You are making your own assignment, and you will be your own best critic. You will not need externally imposed courses, nor marks, nor diplomas, nor a nod from your boss in business or in politics. And this week's opening quote comes from Scott Buchanan. Welcome to Surviving the Matrix, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Maxwell Egan. It's a pleasure to be with you once again, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Have you ever asked yourself what you truly know to be true about anything? One of the things that I've found throughout this life is that the more I know, the more I realize how little I actually know. There are so many mysteries in this world and there are so many things that are simply not what they seem and attempting to find an answer to the human predicament and a way out of the human predicament is a path that is fraught with misdirection and distraction. And sure, there's a lot of really important things going on at the moment on the world stage, and many of them do appear to be very positive on the surface, but there also appears to be a little bit of an undercurrent, an underlying tone that many people simply aren't paying attention to. You know, I find a lot of these things happen over history, especially in the history of the truth movement, a history of the independent media. We've seen so many things that look like they're going to lead us to safety, but there's been an uncomfortable undertone, which has in fact led us somewhere else. I think it's very important that people always look at both sides and as positive as what the right hand is offering you, always to pay attention to what the left hand is doing. Of course, even looking at things in this way, a lot of people will attempt to label you a fear monger simply for not going with the general consensus and saying, oh yes, everything's roses, we're all going to be led to safety. You know, I don't really trust that type of thinking, and I always like to consider the worst and hope for the best, but always look at what the worst could be and always look at where we may be being led through all of these things. And I don't think this is fear-mongering, folks. I just think this is being objective and it's being prudent, and it's very important that people always remember to think for themselves and don't allow themselves to be led by popular opinion. Most especially with the amount of theatrics we see going on in the world today, there's so much out there to lead people down certain pathways. And it's important for people to look at all the information that's being presented to them, but through it all, it's extremely important that people always remain objective and always remember to think for themselves. Just because a lot of people think something is true doesn't make it true just because a lot of people think something is right doesn't make it right. Just because a lot of people think something is good doesn't mean that it's good. You don't have to always follow the general consensus just because that's where it's going. In the case of truth, even a minority of one who thinks that way does not alter the truth of the matter. And certainly I'm not saying remain so sceptical that you won't jump on board with anything. I'm just saying keep an open mind and don't allow hubris to dictate your actions, which is so often the case. When we hear information that we like or we think this is going to support where we want the world to go, and there seems to be a general consensus that this information is true, very often we put our guard down and we sit back and watch the sideshow and hope to be saved. And very often we forget about plan B or plan C or whatever else we had going on because now we can suddenly see this new saviour dawning on the horizon but very often it just turns into something that it wasn't and we've just been distracted away from whatever path we were on again and been convinced to drop whatever activism ball we were bouncing and simply sit back and watch which is so often the case and I see a lot of that happening at the moment with the direction the blockchain and cryptocurrencies are taken and I also see a lot of it happening with the advent of the QAnon phenomenon. A lot of people are sitting back and looking at this and saying, oh my God, this is all for real. All of the bad people are going to be arrested and they're sitting back and waiting for this big change to happen. In many cases, hubris seems to be dictating people's mindsets and they don't seem to be discussing any type of backup plan should things not go the way they think they're going to go. 
The problem is that a lot of people are looking at this information and they're thinking, well, things are going the way we've always wanted them to go. It's all going to happen and I don't have to do anything about it. I don't have to maintain my focus anymore. I can just sit back and watch it all unfold. And the question is, are things unfolding the way they should as a natural result of human intellectual evolution or human spiritual evolution? Or is humanity simply being led into a certain direction whereby they think they are becoming freer, but really what is happening is they're becoming more controlled? You know, a lot of this stuff that we're seeing is basically removing human decision making from certain equations. It's putting it all under the control of AI. And this is the case even with the blockchain, because the blockchain is basically its own thing and it runs its transactions and its ledgers in its own way it removes human decision making from the chain and this is a good thing in many ways as it decentralizes control of currency but it also removes decision making from the minds of the average man on the street you know certain aspects of our lives that we're used to doing certain things that make us human these aspects of ourselves are being removed from us and the machine is making more and more decisions that control everyday actions of our lives. And, you know, as I said, a lot of people think this is a good thing because they're applying it to the currency and they're looking at the control that central banks have had over the currency for so long and the damage that it's done. And so decentralizing that control seems as a good thing. And yes, it is in many ways. But if that decentralization removes decision making from the minds of the people, from the hands of mankind in general, then it could lead to a place that is not exactly where we wanted it to go. That's the thing. You've got to step back and look at this and keep an open mind and be sure to put everything on the world stage and be prepared to step back and always keep the bigger view in mind. Always look at the bigger picture. And it's the same with the QAnon phenomenon. You've really got to step back and look at this and put it where it belongs. And bear in mind, folks, that... All the world is a stage, and even if the information that QAnon is putting out is true, and even if there are going to be a whole bunch of arrests, it's very important to step back from that as well and look at the bigger picture and see what is changing on the ground for the people and what is changing in regard to the world's situation, even should these mass arrests actually happen. Because underneath the entire thing is the smart grid, that is still rolling out and nothing seems to be addressing that. You know, we're seeing all this talk of Pizzagate and pedophiles and all sorts of stuff like this, the Rothschilds, the Clinton Foundation, executive orders freezing the assets of people that are involved in human trafficking. And frankly, that would be just about every government on earth, so I don't know how they're really going to pull that one off. But really, looking at all of this, folks, this is setting certain wheels into motion, but Underneath it, again, is the smart grid, the Internet of Things, and the digital surveillance system that is all coming online, the digitization of currency, China's new One Belt, One Road initiative, and everything that I've been talking about in previous shows. It's all still going on beneath the surface while everybody is distracted with this political theater and this talk of mass arrest that's going on at the moment. And even with the IoT and the smart grid and everything that really should concern us, the reason so many people aren't really concerned about it, I think, is because they're not looking at the bigger picture again. They're not really seeing where we're being led with all this and looking at what it's doing to the human condition. You know, all these different conveniences that we get on our smartphones, I've gone through this so many times before, every time you get one of these little conveniences and one of these little personal assistants, it basically removes you of a life skill. It removes you of your real participation in reality and it creates a digital version of that participation, it basically does everything for you. And this limits your own human potential. It replaces your life skill, your everyday action, your part of being human with a digital version of it, a virtual version of it. And they began this process back in the 50s with the introduction of television, which basically replaced parents with a virtual version of parenting. You know, the parents just put the children in front of the television and the television educated them and looked after them and took up all their time in the afternoon. Parents weren't 
playing with their children in the afternoon and giving them the attention that they normally did. And so we had that generation growing up, Generation X, who were classed as attention seekers. And of course, they were attention seekers because they didn't get any attention from their parents. And not only that, but they also learnt how to fob off that attention themselves. So once they have children, they give their children even less attention than what they got when they were children. And this is how it's been done. And as we get further led into this reality, as the kids are being further led into this way of thinking, they're becoming more and more disconnected from what it means to be human. And what happens when the power goes out? What happens when they lose control of this technology or they get shut out of this technology? And that's the real issue, is getting shut out of the technology, purposely denied access to your digital world, your digital personality. You imagine the amount of control that comes over people's minds with that threat hanging over their heads. That any time you think outside of the box at all, any time you dissent, any time you try to put forth a new idea that the system does not want, you must not think that way, you must comply, and if you do not, you live under the threat of being shut out and denied access to your digital world. You imagine the control that comes over a young mind that grew up in a digital world to have that threat hanging over their head. What would happen to a person if they were completely immersed into this smart system and they dissented in some way or made some decision that was wrong in some way and were suddenly locked out of that reality and locked out of that smart grid? How would they cope with life? They would end up completely stressed. They would end up on some type of medication. They'd end up in a state where they were basically disabled in some way or at least categorized as disabled and what's it going to take when are we going to get to the point when those who are not enhanced or those who refuse to be enhanced those who don't want to merge with AI end up getting stressed about it because they can't access the system by any type of acceptable standards and so they get categorized as being disabled simply because of their unwillingness to accept the technology And that might seem a little far-fetched, but in this ridiculously politically correct world that we're going into, it's not outside the realm of possibility. I mean, if people won't comply, they'll simply get categorised as having a disorder of some kind. You imagine the control that comes over people's minds with that. And we've seen this as well with the introduction of so many new disabilities you know, ADD, ADHD, you know, anything that isn't normal, anything that isn't perfectly mainstream, a child walking between the lines completely, any type of free thinking has been classed as a disability. Any type of stress is being classed as a disability. So we're creating a culture whereby more and more people are becoming more and more stressed and so more and more people are becoming disabled, in inverted commas, in the eyes of the legal and economic system. And you think about it, even the World Health Organization has said that they're expecting stress to be the main cause of disabilities in the future. And in the future, what they're talking about is 2020. And that's not too far in the future, but they're suggesting that most disabilities will be stress-related by the year 2020. And a lot of this comes from the digital world as well. You know, you get into this world where it's all automated. There's no human in there making decisions for you. And you encounter a problem and you try to get this problem rectified. You go online to try to do it and you're given a bot which gives you multiple choice answers. But what if one of those choices isn't the choice that suits you? What if you need to speak to someone and that option simply isn't there? You end up stressed. You end up not in a situation where you get what you want. You can never really get the problem rectified the way you would like it to be rectified. You always have to settle for some sort of compromise or some decision that is made by the machine. And this results in stress. So the whole thing's a play and you get to a point where you realise that this is where we are being led. We are being led into a point, into a place, where as the system becomes more and more automated, more and more mechanized, people lose more and more employment and human decisions are removed from situations more and more, we get to a point where basically the entire human race ends up on a disability pension, or most of it anyway, because most of them simply can't function within the system. And if they can't function within the system, if their jobs are being removed and their normal life skills are being removed, well, what way can you compensate for these people? Well, the best way to do it is to 
put them on some sort of disability pension. And the way you do that is to make every loss of life skill, every life skill they've lost, and every emotion that they feel or any wish to express that emotion, if it's anything apart from bland happiness, becomes a disability. So they're basically disabling the entire human race and they're putting them all on the trash heap. And you look at the disabled people within our society, folks, these are people who are basically put last. In many cultures, they're put last. They're kept well under the poverty line and they're never really given a leg up in any way. And this is all done under the guise of caring for them. You know, the government gives them benefits under the pretense of caring for them when the fact of the matter is that it's the government that's creating most of these disabled people anyway because most of what they are classing as disabilities are simply stress-related or they're related to a loss of life skills, all of which is a result of the actions of government. Well, a result of the actions of government and the system anyway. And I know this probably sounds a little difficult for people to deal with and a little difficult to take, and I'm not saying anything about people with normal disabilities. I mean, there's a lot of people out in the society who have disabilities, very genuine disabilities, who need looking after. What I'm saying, though, is that in this politically correct environment and in the type of world where any type of thinking outside the box is being classed as a disability. I mean, we've even heard anti-authoritarian syndrome, someone who doesn't respect authority, doesn't want to do what they're told all the time. This is actually being seen as a disability. People who won't think inside the box, people who question their government, this is being classed as a mental problem, folks, a mental disorder. So it's very easy to categorize anybody who doesn't think the way you want them to think as being disabled and that's what is happening that's how they're getting around all of this that's how they're getting around the legal system it's how they're getting around people's need to stand up for themselves by simply categorizing them as being disabled or mentally unstable and putting them on medication this of course has all been achieved via the gradual dumbing down of the human race as well. You know, the education system and again, the things that we get on our mobile phones, all the little smart conveniences we get to help us out in our lives all the time, which prevent us from thinking for ourselves. And it's like anything becomes atrophied. As I said previously, if you don't use something, it becomes atrophied. If you don't use your legs, if you sit in a chair for 20 years and don't use your legs, they become atrophied. It's the same with your sight, it's the same with your hearing, and it's the same with your brain as well. If you don't use it, if you don't continue to grow those neural pathways, then they disappear. And the simple fact that people use a GPS to navigate their way around their own city that they live in, so they don't have to think about where they're traveling, they don't have to think about whether they need to turn left or turn right, or they don't have to think about where they're going, they don't have to learn their way anywhere because the machine will take care of it all for them. The machine will think for them, turn right here, turn left there, roundabout coming, merge with the traffic here. The GPS will even tell you that you need to merge with the traffic on the highway. When you're entering the on-ramp on a highway, it will tell you in 400 meters you need to merge with the traffic. Well, of course you do. You're entering a highway. You know you need to merge with the traffic. You don't need to have a machine to tell you. But what this does is it prevents people from thinking about anything. It turns people into these little automatons, these little drones that just do what they're told. Turn left here, turn right there, lift the right leg, lift the left leg. Soon you'll have little implants telling you you have an itchy thigh, you need to scratch it, and it'll tell you how to scratch it. It's getting that bad, ladies and gentlemen. But what this all does is it gradually removes people of their neurological powers. It removes people of their cognitive function. It prevents people from being able to think clearly about anything. It just shuts their brains down. And that is what all of this stuff is doing. That's what all these conveniences are doing. They're removing you of your life skills. Most people don't know how to do any of the most simplest tasks in life anymore because they need to be told how to do it. They need to read instructions on how to do it. They need to have a manual. They need to have something which tells them what to do. As I said a few shows ago, we've got people leaving school, people leaving college who do not even have the intelligence to know how to operate a tape measure. I mean, this is pretty bad, folks. This is a result of the system working purposefully to dumb down humanity. And in that sort of a situation where you don't have any life skills and you don't even have the ability to think clearly, to be able to put two and two together or be able to do the most basic functions without 
getting a packet recipe or something on how to put something together. You mentioned the threat that comes over people's minds of being actually locked out of the system and what they would be faced with if they were locked out of the system. They wouldn't be able to do anything for themselves. They simply would not be able to function. I mean, look what happens to people now if they simply get locked out of Facebook for a week or something like that. And that's because they've thought outside of the box, usually. They've posted something that the Facebook moderators didn't like. They're thinking in a way that people don't want them to think, and so they get penalised. Look what happens to people who are on welfare, who have to go to a meeting for one of these job agencies. They show up five minutes late and they get their pension penalised. They get payments deducted from their pension so they're actually unable to feed their children simply because they were five minutes late for a meeting. All of this sort of stuff is designed to inhibit people's ability to think for themselves and to make sure that they always walk between the lines and do what they're told or suffer a penalty. And all this is about control. It isn't about convenience. It's about control. It's about removing people of every skill they have, even the most basic of skills. And so they are able to be led exactly where you want to lead them. And the threat of locking them out of the system is all you need to control them. Because the system becomes everything to these people. It becomes their entire lives. It becomes everything that they are, everything they identify with. And it's all virtual. None of it exists in the real world. So in that sort of a situation, folks, what happens is that when people get locked out of that virtual world, they are simply unable to function in the normal world because they have never done it before. These are skills that they just don't have because they've never indulged in these skills. They've never participated in reality like a normal human being. And so it becomes an alien world to them. It becomes a world that is not real when really it is the only thing about this world that is real. You know, as I said earlier, one of the things that people are seeking most in the world today is attention. Because they haven't had any attention. They never got attention from their parents. They never got the attention they deserved at school. No one ever listened to them. No one ever allowed them to express themselves. They didn't really know that this is what they were missing in their lives because they've never experienced it to know what it is to begin with. And so they don't know what's been stolen from them. But it's the attention that they deserve from their parents. This is where it all begins. And again, this happened with the advent of television, which replaced the parents. And so now what people do online, their main activity online, most people, is seeking attention. They put their face out there all the time. They go to Snapchat. They go to Instagram. They're always putting themselves out there on Facebook or whatever. It's all about the amount of likes they get. They'll post what they had for breakfast. They'll post a picture of some stupid little doll that they bought or whatever simply for the amount of likes they get because that's what it's all about. They want the attention because that's something that they've never, ever had. As I said, nobody's ever listened to them. No one's ever given them the value that they deserve. No one's ever seen them as something valuable. Of course, their parents may when they're a child, but very often this is just a fashion accessory for a lot of parents in the modern world. You know, they have a child and it's this trendy thing to do. Sometimes they have a child and they love the child dearly, but they still don't know how to give the child the attention it needs and it deserves because they never had that. They never experienced that themselves when they are a child and they simply don't realize what this technology is doing to remove the attention from the children and prevent parents from ever being able to look after their children in a way that they should because they simply don't know they don't understand the world has changed so much in the last few generations and so what this has all become about is attention seeking and it isn't really even attention seeking in a bad way. It's just simply people wanting to be noticed, wanting to be heard. But attention has become one of the most valuable commodities in the modern world. It really has. This is what people are seeking more than anything. And so they become preoccupied. It's the problem. You know, there's nothing wrong with wanting attention. It's just that people have become preoccupied and it's become one of the most sought after commodities in the modern social system. You know, people just want to be noticed. And of course, this is a natural progression. This is a natural result of people being homogenized through the education system, through the social system, through Facebook, through everything. You know, people are all of equal value. People have equal value, but not all people are born equal. Not all people are born with equal abilities, equal attributes, equal creative potential, equal intellectual potential. People are vastly different in many ways, even though they are all the same in as much as they all have equal value. They all have equal standing. They all have equal worth. 
You know, everybody has a right to be here. Everybody deserves to be heard. But when you get an entire society and you homogenize them, you make them all the same, and then you take all of the attention, the parental attention that they would have got, all of the individual attention they would get normally from teachers in the old ways, in the old schools, when there were small classes and people were learning life skills all along the way, and they were rewarded by the particular attributes that they had. You know, teachers used to look for certain attributes in students and find out what areas they excelled in and then help them excel in those areas. We don't get any of that in the modern education system. It's complete homogenization. You must all think the same way. Of course, when you start doing this to people, they never get noticed. They never feel that they have any real worth. And the only worth that they can find for themselves is in this superficial world. It's whether they can get a lot of likes on Instagram or Snapchat or whatever. It's whether they can put their face out there and they can create the attention that they need for themselves and be noticed in some way. And then even when they get noticed, they don't really know what to do with it. It's just this endorphin state they get into. It's because we've been trained to measure each moment by the amount of gratification or enjoyment we get from that moment. This is again through all of the dopamine addiction from mobile phones. I mean, it's so deep, folks, how we've been manipulated and how we've been brought to this point. But essentially what I'm trying to say here is that when you homogenize society through the education system and you limit their ability to be able to think clearly and and ever really see their own creative potential, then they get stressed. They get stressed inside without even knowing what they're being stressed about. And they start looking for the attention that they feel that they need, not even knowing that that's what they're seeking. It's a very, very interesting place we've been led to, folks, but a lot of people in society are simply searching for something and they don't know what it is because they don't understand what has been stolen from them. And all of this is a result of this society. It's all a result of the remoulding of the social systems, the remoulding of the education systems. And it's very insidious, and it's been done very deliberately. It's been done by design, and it's been done by a very small group of people who are seeking to control the rest of mankind. And I've got to say, folks, that they've done a pretty good job so far of getting it to this point and really controlling the mindset of people. But fortunately, I think a lot of people are beginning to see it now. A lot of people are beginning to see just what sort of mind control they're under, and they're attempting to find solutions. Of course, the hardest part is understanding how the mind control works, and that's what I attempt to do with these shows. That's why I go through some of these thought processes, and why I like to keep the thought processes open as well. Why I don't really come on here with anything planned, because when I start thinking and talking, I never really know where it's going to go. And sometimes I make mistakes, and I have to stumble my way through it, and I think it's important for people to hear that process. I think it may help other people with their thought processes, and perhaps looking at things from a little bit of a wider perspective but here we are folks we've reached break time so i'm going to have to leave it there and we're going to take a break thank you for joining me on the show today it's always a pleasure to have your company i'll be back to speak to you again in a few minutes don't go away welcome back to the show ladies and gentlemen as i was saying before the break One of the most difficult things about attempting to wake people up to the mind control that they're under is the fact that they don't have a reference point. You know, if you control someone but they don't know they are under control, it makes them very difficult for them to see that control. For example, if you were born and modifications were made to your eyes so you could only see in black and white, it would be very difficult for you to ever understand the concept of colour. And you wouldn't know what you were missing. And if everybody was like that, they wouldn't realize that the world was colorful because they wouldn't have any reference point. They wouldn't know what they were missing out on to begin with. So they'd never know how they'd been put under control. And again, they've managed to do this with people's attention, people's need to belong to something, this need to belong to a family unit, the need to be cared about, the need to be seen as something of value. They've managed to take that away from people by simply destroying the family unit. And they've managed to destroy the family unit by first enslaving people to this economic system whereby it becomes necessary for both parents to be working in order to support the household and by the introduction of television to replace the role that parents once played. 
And people that grow up within this environment, it seems all very perfectly normal, but it's not normal at all. The breakdown of the family unit is in fact integral to the construction of a mind control system and construction of the control grid and a construction of a disconnected society whereby everybody is looking for instant gratification in everything that they do because they are desperately searching for happiness because happiness is our natural state and we simply don't get any of that. You know, we get all this stuff that looks like happiness, but it's not happiness at all. It's all this stuff that's put there to distract us from what we are missing inside. External stuff to replace the hollow emptiness that many people feel inside simply because of this breakdown that occurred in the family unit. And many people won't even see that as being the cause of it, but it is. You know, most people simply want to be loved. Most people want to grow up in an environment where they are loved. But this society itself makes that environment almost impossible to achieve. You've always got to have at least one person off working, one parent off working. And even when they've got a house somewhere to live, it's always a struggle to keep that house. And even with running the house, I mean, there's so many little things that are put there to make sure the family's stressed out all the time. And this is the type of environment that the kids grow up in. And the parents simply don't have time to look after the children in that sort of an environment. And because we've separated ourselves as well from our older relations and from our larger families in general, you know, the breakdown of the greater family unit, this is very, very noticeable in the West. And this has also created a situation where young families don't have any support mechanism around them. They don't have the support of the family at large. You know, all the cousins and the parents and everybody living together. This is the way it used to be. This is the way it is in third world countries. It's the way it is in many European countries still. There's always this greater family unit, this greater support group around you to help you through life. And this love and this care is there and you don't have as much mental disharmony in these situations and in these countries. You don't have as much homelessness in these countries as well because, you know, everybody looks after each other. And this is something that I really noticed in LA as well, you know, the amount of homeless people that I saw in LA, but they're always black homeless people or white homeless people, very few Hispanic homeless people because the Hispanics come from a third world country and they come from greater family units. They have families that are very, very tight and very connected with each other and very much look out for each other. So you see very few homeless Asian people, very few homeless Filipino people, very few homeless Latino people, because they all have extended families around them and they are all looked after by their extended families. And it isn't a matter that they even need to go and ask for help. It's just the way things are done, because that's what you do for family. We don't have any of this in the West. We're trained to throw our kids out as soon as they're old enough to go and get a job and support themselves, we throw them out of home. And then the parents wonder why they are thrown into a nursing home as soon as they get old and decrepit and they're unable to look after themselves. The kids don't really want to know about them, don't want to keep them around, don't want to look after them. And why should they? Because the parents threw the children out as soon as it was financially viable for them to do so. And all of this is a construct, folks. All of this is designed to remove real values from us and to superimpose these other values, these financial values, these economic values, none of which have anything to do with real life. You know, so we've had all of this stuff taken from us and we've had all this other stuff superimposed over it to take its place. We've had our parents replaced by television. We've had our free thinking replaced by political correctness. We've had our ability to even think for ourselves replaced by automation and by personal assistance. And the problem is that we don't see the mind control because we don't have a reference point. We don't understand what's been taken from us. You know, a lot of people don't see the loss of life skills that they've been subject to and they don't see it as anything significant because they never had those life skills to begin with. They were never taught these life skills and so they don't know what they've lost and they can't see how a loss of these basic life skills controls them so much. And again, this is because they simply don't have a reference point because it's not something they ever experienced. It's not something they ever saw in their parents. It's not something they were taught at school. It's simply not something that they know. So how can you miss what you don't know has been taken from you? It's the same with our history. You know, we don't even understand how we got here, what history has been. A couple of shows ago, it might have been the last show, I talked about the mud flood that appears to have gone across Europe. You know, they're finding buildings that are basically got 12 feet of mud 
covering the whole first floor of these buildings. This is right up through Russia, through Holland, through Italy, right across Europe. So what happened in our history? We don't even know that. We don't have any reference point. So we don't know what we were capable of, what we built, how things were really run before that time. And we're talking as little as four or 500 years ago. I mean, ultimately, all we know is that which exists within living memory. Everything else is hand-me-downs. Everything else is simply stuff that we're told. And when you look at this mud flood that went across Europe, not to mention the innumerable artifacts that have been found all over this earth, which tell a completely different version of history to what we've been told, you realize that we don't even know what we are or where we came from, so we don't have a reference point there. So that's why it's so difficult to find freedom. That's why it's so difficult to find our way out of this mess, because we don't have any reference point of what it once looked like. You know, we know so little about where we are, how we got here, who we are, and what's going on, and who really controls things, that it just becomes absurd. We've got lots of people we can point the finger at, and we're always given a face. It's always someone evil, the evil boogeyman. You know, Henry Kissinger or George Soros or it was David Rockefeller for a while, but he died, unfortunately. So the title, the crown seems to have shifted over to George Soros. Anybody we can find to put a face on it, point the finger at. And folks, if you can see them and point the finger at them, then they're not really the one who's pulling the strings. They're just a puppet. They're just a face that's been put out there. You know, and ultimately, as I've said so many times, it's us that supports it all. It's us that holds it all up. It doesn't matter what these ruling cacistocracy want to do. If we don't support it, then it can't work. And we support it all. That's why it's in the state that it's in. And what we have to do is identify the problems. And the problem, the first problem, really is mind control. Our loss of self. There's been so much loss of self, it's just ridiculous. The question is what to do about it. What to do about our situation. Well, I really believe the first thing is for people to maintain focus, to pay attention to don't allow themselves to be led. You know, as I said, all this stuff that's coming out on 4chan about mass arrests and Trump doing all of these 4D chess moves and all this stuff, QAnon, have a look around you and have a look at what you're seeing on the ground, see whether it equates to what you're seeing in your local community. Have a look at the smart grid, have a look at the smart meters, have a look at the control system and ask how it affects any of this. You know, the whole smart grid, the Internet of Things, the digital currency, the way things are going, the way things are becoming fully autonomic, fully automated, the way we are being led into a state where, as I said earlier, the World Health Organization themselves is saying that stress will be the biggest cause of disability. You know, we're being led into a state where we are all becoming disabled in the eyes of this system, simply because we can't cope with the loss of self that is occurring. You know, have a look at all of this and ask how any of this QAnon stuff is going to affect any of it. And even if Trump suddenly appears as the white knight on the big charger and comes to save us all and arrests Hillary Clinton and the Clinton Foundation and George Soros gets put out of business and all this stuff, have a look at what else is going on in the world. I mean, he's fully capitulating to the needs of Israel at every opportunity that he can. He's pulled funding or threatening to pull funding from Palestine, basically blackmailing them, saying, look, we're not going to give you any aid at all if you don't capitulate to the needs of Israel. You know, just not allowing them to even stand up for themselves, giving them no dignity whatsoever. You know, it's pretty disgraceful the way he's treating the Palestinian people, and it's pretty disgraceful the way he's capitulating to Israel. You know, Israel is an abomination, it really is, and it's very, very much a litmus test for any politician. If they are going to be supporting this state, then they're not really someone who cares about human rights. And that should be a good sign for everybody. And that's what Trump is doing. You know, regardless of anything else you might think he's doing on the ground, he's doing this as well. And this is not a very good sign. You know, but all of this smart grid is the real concern. The Internet of Things and the 5G control grid that is coming online is the real issue that we need to be looking at. Yeah, because it's something that we can deal with. The In Power movement has shown that we can deal with this. These liability notices that they keep pushing are actually working. And this will work for just about anything that this system wants to throw at you. It really will. It just requires people growing a little bit of backbone and actually standing up for themselves and doing it. But it does work. There are all sorts of things we can do. But it's important that people through all of this... Pay attention to what is happening around them. Pay attention to this control grid. Pay attention to the smart grid. 
You know, pay attention to the Internet of Things, what it is, what it's doing, where it's going. Pay attention to the automation. Pay attention to the 5G towers that are still going up everywhere. While everyone's squabbling over whether QAnon is telling them the truth and whether there's going to be war with North Korea, this whole system is still rolling out underneath everything. As it has been for quite a while, and it's something that I've been talking about for quite a while, it's something that a lot of people are talking about, but there's so much theatre now that has been put out, I believe, especially to combat this 5G knowledge and especially to keep people distracted, that so many people simply aren't noticing it. And even if they do notice it, they're still getting caught back into the spy novel version of reality. They still want to know what their next instalment's going to be court cases and this and that and what are the results of this and who's going to get arrested now and who's going to do this and who's going to do what but again look around you and see what is changing in your community see what your police are doing see what your local council is doing see whether things are any easier for you at all on the ground see whether the wars are de-escalating overseas they're not everything's just continuing the way it always has been the way it always does nothing is changing you know it's just so much theatre going on at the moment, this whole QAnon thing, this should tell you that there's something very, very major going on underneath everything, and they want you distracted. They want you sitting there waiting for this big day when everything's going to change. And how many times have we been offered this? You know, Drake, Swiss Indo, the OPPT. How many things have been offered to us which have attempted to get us to sit back and believe that we've been saved? Hell, we've had people saying the world is run by ETs and there's going to be alien disclosure and that it's imminent and it's going to happen any time and people still believe it even though they've been saying it since 1976. So many things have been offered to us to make us believe that we're about to be saved. And it's always, always something that is external to ourselves and something that we do not have to participate in. We just have to sit back and wait and watch it happen. But it's never happened. Because it's only ever going to come from the people. It's only ever going to come when people refuse to tolerate wrong behavior and refuse to comply with this control grid. And the control grid is the 5G grid. It's the smart grid. It's the Internet of Things. It's this whole AI system that's coming online. It's where we've been led to through the Internet, through our loss of life skills, through the completely ridiculous changes that have been made to the education system. The rubbish they're teaching the kids now is unbelievable. And these teachers really need to be reprimanded for that. You know, and following orders, I mean, what sort of an excuse is that? Oh, we're just following orders, what the government's telling us to do. Why don't they ever vet that? Why don't they ever question those orders? Why don't the people at the top ever question those orders? They don't because they're puppets, because they're compromised, because it's all part of the same thing. And it's about time we step back and looked at all this, folks. You know, it's great to see all of this attention coming from the QAnon stuff, and it's great to see people out there spreading awareness of how corrupt everything is. But don't think this is the salvation you've been waiting for. You know, the only way it is ever going to be that is if we pressure it to happen. But if we pressure that to happen, then we need to keep up the pressure and have this smart grid dealt with as well. Have this whole digitization of reality dealt with, the digitization of knowledge, the loss of life skills, and what has been done to the education system. All of this stuff needs to be dealt with. It isn't just a matter of arresting the Clinton Foundation and putting George Soros out of business. It isn't even a matter of stopping Israel in its tracks from what it's doing and arresting Bibi Netanyahu. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on here. There's a great many cards in play, and it's extremely important that we pay attention. Don't allow ourselves to be distracted. Don't allow ourselves to be led and pay attention to what is really going on. You know, I think most people know inside that there has to be something more. They know that the world is bad, but they just don't think they can fix it because they really don't understand themselves. They don't understand what they're capable of. They don't understand the true power of a human being because they have no reference point. As I said earlier, we've had so much taken from us in regard to our history And in regard to the true knowledge of ourselves as well, and when we try to rediscover this knowledge, there's so many rabbit holes for us to go down, so many paths to lead us away from what is inside us all the time. Because that's where the answers will be found. You won't find them in books. You won't find them reading self-help books. You won't find them reading books by gurus or even by reading books on meditation. You may find it through meditation itself. 
you know, by exploring the inner self, you may find what you're looking for. You may find that true power, that true Christ consciousness, if that's what you want to call it. Now, whatever it is, that spark of awareness, that spark of enlightenment. But as the saying goes, folks, enlightenment is a destructive process. It has nothing to do with being better. It has nothing to do with being more spiritually aware. It doesn't mean you're going to sit there in this warm, fuzzy state of love and light. Enlightenment is a breaking down of everything which is false, which is very often a breaking down of every single thing that you believe to be true, everything that we thought was real about this world. And it's a very, very uncomfortable state for many people to even want to pursue. Too many people are comfortable in their environment, they're comfortable in their servitude, and this is mainly because they simply don't know they are in a state of servitude. They just know something's wrong, but they don't know they're in a state of servitude because, again, they have no reference point as to what freedom looks like and to what they are really capable of. I mean, to say the answer to all of this is love and a rediscovery of what love really is, you risk going all hippie on people and sounding that way to people and people will look at you and say, well, this is just this airy-fairy solution that isn't going to work. But it really is a loss of love. It's a loss of this joy of life that has really led to this point, folks. As I said at the start of the show, the breakdown of the family unit, that love that we receive from our parents, that real connection, that real bond we have with our parents and our siblings when we're a child, when this bond is severed, it creates a huge schism in our minds. And I remember when that bond was severed. You know, I can remember so much about my childhood. I remember things from being very, very young. And I remember when I found out that the world wasn't this innocent, wonderful place and that people couldn't be trusted. I remember what it did to me. I remember the first time I experienced pain, the first time I experienced deceit, the first time I experienced lies, the first time I experienced someone maliciously going out of their way to hurt me simply for the pleasure of doing so. And it completely shattered my entire perspective of reality. Now, I knew before that that things were terribly wrong, but I thought that everybody must know that things are terribly wrong and that we shouldn't have to pay to be alive and this is probably not the right world, that we we're probably born into the wrong world. But hey, since we're all here, we could still probably all get along and try to help each other. And I really loved the people around me. I really loved my siblings. I loved my sisters. I loved all the people that I met when I was a small child. It wasn't until I found out that they didn't love me and that people went out of their way to hurt me that I realized just how disconnected people are and how much they need to get energy from other people. And unfortunately, it's far easier to induce pain and suffering in someone than it is to induce happiness in someone. It takes far less energy to do that and you get a far quicker energy harvest as a response. And so that's unfortunately the path that many people take. And I found all this out very, very young. But I remember how much it shattered me. I remember how much it fractured my awareness, how much it made me withdraw into myself, and how long it took me to actually even want to participate in this world in any positive way, simply because of that foundation that was laid when I was a small child. It really affected me, folks. It really did. Now, saying the wrong thing to a child, saying something hurtful to a child or doing something hurtful to a small child can have an effect on that child which will last a lifetime. It really will. You can put a chip on both their shoulders that they will carry around for the next 40 years before they realize that they've just been carrying around this weight that they didn't need to bear. And Indeed, it may not even happen then. They may carry it around for their entire life and never realize where it even came from. You know, they get this misconception of what they are due to the influences of their environment and it's important to know that we can all do that and we can all affect people in this way and we can affect ourselves in this way as well. You know words can be dangerous things and they can be damaging things and so can actions but they can have the opposite effect as well and we can undo this damage and we can always think of this when we're interacting with people and make sure that our words and our actions are always positive and uplifting and doing something positive and uplifting for the world. Lead by example in what you do. And I know it can be difficult. I know you just want to lash out sometimes. Hey, I want to lash out sometimes, and I do lash out sometimes. Sometimes I respond when people attack me. Sometimes I just can't help myself. But try not to do that, folks. Try not to follow me in that example. And try not to do it yourself. And 
even if you have to respond, well, okay, respond, but don't be the aggressor. Don't be the one who trolls others. Don't be the one who instigates these problems. If you have to defend yourself in one of these situations, well, do so. But don't be the instigator. Always give people the benefit of the doubt. Always begin by treating people with the respect that you would like to be treated with and that they deserve, because everybody does deserve to be treated with respect, to some degree anyway. At least they deserve the freedom to be heard, and the freedom to be able to voice their opinion, whatever it may be. And if you can't respect people enough to at least allow them to voice their opinion, then how can you ever expect your opinion to be heard? But do that, folks. Allow others to voice their opinion so that you do allow your opinion to be heard, and always continue to think for yourself. Don't be part of the flow. Don't think what you're told. Don't think what everybody else is thinking simply because they think it. Think for yourself and keep things in focus, folks, and we will make a change here. You know, we are in an incredibly volatile time at the moment. There's so much going on. And all I've really been attempting to point out through this show is how this all serves to control us and the need for people to maintain this focus on the bigger picture and don't allow themselves to be led. Look at how any of these things are affecting themselves on the ground and keep the attention where it should be. All the world is a stage, ladies and gentlemen. I know I say it all the time, but it's very, very important that people remember that. Well, we've reached that time again, ladies and gentlemen, where it is the end of the show. As I've been saying quite often lately, I'll be speaking at the Anacapulco Conference in Mexico in February, around about February 14th to February 18th, something like that. You'll find a link to that on the Crow House website. And if you go and click that banner and go and buy a ticket and use the coupon of the Crow House, you'll find you'll get a discount to that event as well. And that's always a good thing. And it looks like I might actually be doing a couple more talks in Europe as well. It was going to be the last talk that I was doing. And this is definitely the last tour that I'm doing for a while. But the tour is still ongoing. And because it looks like the Cambo workshop in Hawaii is probably not going to go ahead for March, that will probably be later in the year. So I will probably be in Europe for March, which means I may actually be appearing personally at the Open Mind event in Ireland. I'll just pencil that in there for now, but there's a very good chance I can actually get over to that event and make a personal appearance. So it won't just be a Skype event. And that would be good for the people uh, living in Ireland, anybody who would like to come along to that. And it's going to be a very good event anyway, folks, Open Mind in Ireland. You'll find a link to it on my website, and I think you'll find that there's a Facebook page there as well. If you just Google Open Mind Conference Ireland or perhaps Open Mind Conference 2 Ireland, then you should find information regarding that event. But I'll make sure to get a banner up on the website as well. But there's a good chance that I might be speaking at that event personally. And Ian Crane has also asked if I would like to speak at AV9. And there's a good chance that I may actually be able to do that as well. And that would be in May. And that would most definitely be the last talk that I'm doing until at least 2020. That's if I decide that I really want to go back on the road again come 2020. I am getting a little long in the tooth for too much more of these long flights, folks. The problem is living in Australia, of course. It's very difficult to travel anywhere with ease when one lives in Australia. And these long flights are kind of really getting to me. So that's the reason this is the last tour for quite a while. But you never know the way it's looking. I may actually be speaking at Anacapulco in February and at the Open Mind Conference in Ireland in March and at Ian Crane's AV9 in May. But just pencil those last two in for now, and I'll keep you posted as more travel details come to hand. It often depends on other people and where they are flying me to and where I end up being, because obviously I don't control many of the travel plans. That's all other people. But I'll just put that out there now, and I'll keep you posted on what my whereabouts will be. For those who are interested in attending the Cambo workshop in Hawaii in March, there's a very good chance that I'll be in LA for perhaps two weeks at the end of February, and there's a very good chance I can put together a Cambo workshop there for those who would like to attend. 
and I will keep you posted on that as well. Please don't email me and ask me about it at the moment because it's a little bit too early to let you know. But once it gets a little bit closer to the time, if it's going to happen, then I'll put some details up on the website. But that is it for me, folks. I've completely run out of time. Thank you to all those who continue to listen to the show. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the so many kind emails that so many people send me. There really has been a flood of them lately, and I'm sorry that I've got so many there on backlog that I need to answer, and I will get to that. And thank you, thank you, thank you to all those who continue to support the Patreon account and support me financially, because that really is the only thing that keeps the show on the air. But that is it for me, folks. I'll look forward to speaking to you again next week. I'm pretty confident that I can bring you a show again next week. And please take very good care until then. In luck, cash.